This conference is brought to you by Callstack, your React and React Native development experts. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Uh, before I get started and say thanks to the CoolSack organizers, it's really been beautiful so far. Can we have just a quick round of applause for them, for the team? <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and a huge shout out to Matos. Probably can't hear me, but thank you. You've been great. So thanks for, for all the help. So my name is Johannes Emanuel, and I work as a staff engineer for HelloFresh. Um, the world's largest milk aid company. Today, I'm going to be talking about bridging the platform UI gap with Gen AI. Everything I'm going to talk about started six months ago when myself and a relatively small team were tasked with an interesting project. So our task was to migrate existing native apps, I'm talking iOS and Android, so a decent flow of that into React Native. For the most part, if you've ever used HelloFresh, the flow that I'm talking about is essentially the shopping journey. So when you come on the, the application, whether that's mobile or web, you want to shop, you want to choose your meals, you want to check what's in your cart. That's precisely what I'm talking about. So by, any, by every stretch of imagination, it wasn't a simple project. OK, that brings us to, to the core of the talk itself, how we leverage code agents to make this being more smoother, um, can I get a show of hands if you've worked with Kaza, Windsurf? You have? Pretty much everyone, I suppose. Brilliant. Um, that's what I thought. So you will, you will be able to relate to most of the things I'm going to talk about today. Great. First, let's start with some context. Now, remember why I started? We had native applications. We wanted to migrate them to React Native. But the same flows existed on the web as well, right? So what we had to do was speak a reference to do the migration to React Native. We started off with the web. For context here, the web repository, give or take, has about 10,000 React components. So it's a lot of comp components to work through here. And the shopping journey that we really cared about was about 500 React components. Still huge. There's no chance I'm going to talk about how we migrated 500 React components in the in the 20 minutes talk. So what we're going to do is focus a little bit more on what I think is a very interesting part of the whole flow. I know we're going to have lunch soon. Don't get too hungry. Uh, just stay with me for the next 20 minutes and then we go have lunch. Deal? Brilliant. So what you have here is what we call the product card component. If you've ever used HelloFresh, if you intend to use HelloFresh, there's no way you haven't seen this. Right, this is where you see the title of the mail, what you're going to have, the description, some quick information about what you're going to get, the calories, ETC. Right, it's where you increase, decrease the amount that you're going to get in your box. Some might argue that without this component, we don't have a business, right? So, critical component. Even more context. Um, <laughs> If I go further, the first thing you're probably saying to yourself is, come on, it's just a single component. How, how hard can it be to migrate this? Just slot it in cursor and you should get the job done. Well, there's a few things that make it a bit more tricky. Um, a few more contexts on, on, on the card itself. Just the card, just the status quo, is about 13,000 lines of code. Right? So if you do three to four characters per token, you're looking at roughly 160k tokens. That is huge, right? Secondly, the card itself had within it multiple delivery and subscription states. So if you've got, if you post customer, you've got post delivery, the view you see here is different, right? If your subscription is active, it's different. If we just send the mail to you, we show you something different. So there's a lot of states in here that we have to work through. And finally, we also had multiple visual experiments that were being run in this card, right? So all the whole ABC variants. Uh, so this was one, this was a tough nut to crack. Okay, um, well, not to do. Uh, we did it, don't worry. 
Uh, it was important to do it so we could just prove the hypothesis it wasn't going to work. But you can try. So we tried to one-shot this. Uh, my team used cursor at the time, so it was just easy to just pull the whole directory in there and say, rewrite this into React Native. I did try this with Gemini. At the time, Claude had a 200k context window. Um, cause, well, it just didn't work. It all flopped. Right, that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. And you're probably not convinced, and you're asking yourself, come on, I've seen Twitter, <laughs> I've seen Twitter say, you know, I built an entire SaaS application in 24 hours. What are you on about? Uh, there's a few more things, then that's what this talk is going to be centered about. I'm going to highlight the three main problems, and then I'm going to work through all the problems and how we approach them. And what I'm helping is, you know, you're going to pick one or two tips and potentially apply to your project and potentially reduce the frustration that we get when working with these agents. First one that I've touched upon just slightly is the problem with the large context. So remember, we're working with two different code bases here. We've got the web repository, we've got the React Native repository. You've already seen this as well. The second problem was that component was huge, right? And the third one, which I think is the most interesting one here, is we wanted deterministic outputs. So we were not trying to we're not trying to get creative here. We already had existing APIs and existing behavior, so it was important to sort of match that one-to-one. -one. We're not trying to get creative, right? So these are the three problems. What I'm gonna do is then delve into each of them and show you how we worked around them. First, the problem with the context. So, again, the React Native repository was much newer, given the project was much newer, so different technologies, different ways of doing things as opposed to the web. But it was important for the agent to understand both, right? But still, both of them would just be too much context. And this is why I like the term selective context. What we needed was for the AI to know everything, but not actually everything, but more importantly, just the bits that were important to get the work, the job done. In our case, this was relatively easy to get around. If you use Views Code or Cursor, there's a native multi-read workspace support. Um, so what we do is just create a code workspace file, point these to the two directories, and then boom, the agent knows about both. It still doesn't solve the initial problem though, still too much. So this is where we then try and cut out the things that we don't need. In our case with Cursor, this was quite easy to do with a Cursor Ignore file. But if you're using Cloud Code, Gemini, Windsurf, doesn't really matter, you can get around that with any of these as well. Okay, uh, now how did we deal with this, the, the large context? Um, so, like I was saying before, Cloud Code, or Cloud, uh, at the time that we did this, just had a 200K context, right? So just slotting this in there was already almost exhausting that context. If you're very familiar with the space, you probably know that sometime in August, Claude released a one million context window. Um, but still, everything that I'm going to talk about it translates really well. So how did we get around this? First, the first part of the solution here was focusing on single responsibility, something we've all heard before, right? Um, so what I'm showing here is a certain view Remember why I talked about views, the cards having different views. This is just a precise, a set in view of the card. And what we did further was sort of break this down into very localized tasks per agent session. The real winner is at the bottom there, is the Git work trees, because what this helped us do was essentially take the directories and duplicate multiple of this, so you could have, you could spin up five different work trees, in simple terms, directories, and you could have the agents all work across them without problems, right? So different localized tasks all across different work trees. I don't know why people don't use this enough. It's, it's amazing what you can do with this. Uh, <laughs> now to the part that I love the, the, the most. How could we get the AI? So when you think about how LLMs work, um, they are, a bit more probabilistic, 
right? So what we're trying to do here almost seems like the opposite, because we're trying to be a bit more deterministic about the outputs. And there's just two main things talking about deterministic here. What we really cared about was firstly the API, and secondly, the V behavior, right? How this worked. We wanted to remember, we wanted a one-to-one -one match with both. Okay, first thing we did, you've probably heard this one before, is we had the agents write failing tests um, before continuing with the implementation. So I've been writing software for over 10 years now. Um, and when you write front-end code, TDD is not something you do all the time. Um, and if anyone tells you they do that, as a web developer, they're probably lying to you or trying to get that, trying to pass the interview. They just don't. <laughs> or we, we don't tend to for some reason, except to write in utility functions and the likes. But with agents, it becomes a little more, more important, right? Because what this helps you to do is have something of a self, self-correcting flow. And I'm going to show you what that looks like for us, or what that looked like for us. Was you have the coding agent do something which you know, you've asked it to do. The first, you have a write test, um, as you would expect. You, it verifies that this test fails. Um, this is where in your prompt you instructed not to go ahead and implement it. Just verify that it fails. Most of these have access to a terminal tool, so it's easy to do this verification. And then the cycle continues, the agent then writes the code, can now verify that the test passes, and then the cycle continues. So this is a pattern you're going to see all through the talk, is essentially these self-correcting flows being one of the pillars of how we go these working properly. Secondly, we gave agents access to more tools. So very similar to how we work as humans, or human engineers, um, <laughs> the more iterative the work is, the better the output you can get. Most of the times, right? When I work on a problem once, I just go take a shower, come back to it, I've got, I've got brilliant ideas. The same thing with, with the agents. The more they can iterate, the more they can self-correct, the better, the better the output you get here. In practice, what this looked like for us was say, you have the agent do something. In our case, remember, we're going from web to mobile. Um, so it was easy to spin up a web server, have the agent go on there, um, write, I've been written code to satisfy the given requirement, but then the web server that we've got running can mimic whatever state we wanted for the product card. Now the agent can use the, the Puppeteer MCP tool, take screenshots of that, validate it against its implementation to see if it looked, if it worked, right? And then the cycle again continues, right? It's the second time I'm showing this because it's pivotal to how we go this work in. It's this self-correcting agentic flows is how, you get, is how you get things working, or it's how we got things working. Okay, and finally, um, one of the more important things we did, and this one required a little more human intervention, was we enforced deterministic APIs. I've got a simple example here that I'm gonna talk through, and it's intentionally simple so I can explain the concept before I show how we did it. First, two things. Um, we do this for humans first, and it turns out it's excellent for agents. So take a look at what we've got here. Does this work? Yes, it does, if you can see that. Um, so we've got, this is a simple type definition for a state, right? We have a success represented by a Boolean, You've got data R represented by a data object. You've got its loading represented by a Boolean. And you've got error represented by a Boolean. What the hell is wrong with this? It looks good. For the most part, it works. And you're going to find code like this pretty much everywhere, if we're being honest. But the problem with this is you make it really easy to have or to end up with impossible UI states. So with how we've modeled this, you're very easily going to have, or you could have a state that turns out to have success being true and error being true at the exact same time. And the bigger problem is you cannot, 
enforce this not happening. Just by virtue of how you've typed this, TypeScript cannot catch the problem here. Right, TypeScript thinks this is excellent code. Well, maybe not excellent. TypeScript thinks there's no errors. You know something is broken, but you don't know how you go here. You've made, you've made it relatively easy to have an impossible state. Now, if you think humans can get confused by this, how much more an LLM agent, right? If it works, why not? They do hallucinate, don't they? So how do we get around this? So what we did, again, like I said, this was the part where, you know, uh, we're still engineers after all. AI is going to do everything, but we're still engineers, right? So we put our heads together, and then we make sure that for the product card in this, in this particular example, we came up with deterministic states for all the relevant variants of that card. So in this very simple example here, <laughs> OK, I'm going to use my hands. Uh, you see, you've got three different variants. You've got a skipped variant. That variant has got its own relative properties tied to that variant. You've got a loading variant with eight on as well, and then you've got an added variant. And within each variant, you can even go further and have difference as well. You should notice that we're using discriminated unions here. That's, that's a reason why that's important. Now, the good part of this is then if you use an exhaustive switch like this, the real winner is at the bottom right there, is you can then exhaustively check this. So if I, for example, wrote milk kits or ready to eat, or I removed any of these cases, TypeScript is going to yell. And, and we've made it, just by changing how we structure the data, we've made it impossible to make the mistake that I showed you before for humans and for agents alike, literally impossible to do that. This one brings us to pretty much the same thing that I've been talking about here, is what happened here, or what the flow looked like for us, is we did model these deterministic states, right? We take that, it was essentially a prompt, <laughs> uh, we pass this to the, the coding agents, um, they could go ahead, do the work, but use TypeScript to validate what they've done, see that there are no errors, right? And then, if for some reason there's a problem, TypeScript fails, they self-correct, try to fix it, the passes, and the cycle continues, right? So back to, you, back to the initial thing that I mentioned, self-correcting flows. So, Quick summary, so everything that I've said has come down to two things, really. The first being simplified context, right? I prefer to call these selective context, right? Um, people say the more the AI knows, the better. Not really. Up to a certain point, it's just, you know, downhill. And secondly, self-correcting agentic flows, right? The more you can have these self-correcting flows, I find this to be true even if you're building building agents, the more of these self-correcting flows you can have, at least for us, the more confidence in the output of the agents. And this brings us back to where I started. By applying these you know, little tips, tips and tricks here and there, we were able to successfully convert these web components to mobile UI, and more importantly, streamline what would have taken us weeks, some would say months, into a few hours. And more importantly, doing this with um, <laughs> as little frustration as possible. All right? Um, so that's been my time. Thank you all for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs>